Now, I'm the kind of woman who likes to spend a little time in self-reflection and be very self-aware. But I have a little shortcut to help me realize who I am. That's because I've realized that all black women come in fours, at least in Hollywood, right? You have Waiting to Exhale, so you've got Bernadine, Savannah, Robin, and Gloria. And then if you look at Living Single, I'm a 90s girl, you've got Khadija, Regine, Sinclair, and Maxine. And y'all, the color purple is coming back, and you look over there, you've got your Sugar Avery, a Sophia, Celie, and Nettie. We come in fours, so it's very easy to find out who you are. So I was having a conversation recently with a girlfriend, and, you know, we were having sister talking and talking about who we are. And I'm in auntie status right now, so I started reminiscing like an auntie would do. And I said, girl, when I was back in college, I was a Sophia. And so as I started telling her the story, picture this. It was almost 30 years ago. I was a student at Michigan State University. And I'm up in my loft bed, hurriedly reading my assignment for my diversity in education class. And all of a sudden, I got this tightness in my chest. I was reading a book called White Teacher by this woman named Vivian Paley. She wrote it back in 79. Well, the school she was working at was newly integrated, so it was mostly white students with a few black children. So she thought it would be a good idea if she took a little extra effort to connect with the children. So for example, in the book she said she went up to a little boy, hi little Steven, I love the way your orange t-shirt matches your brown skin. And then she went over to little Charlene and said, hi, little Charlene, your afro is so soft and round. And then she touched it. <laughs> That's why my chest got a little tight. Well, you know how we are about people touching our hair. And so I jumped up, ran down the ladder of my bed, and I marched Sophia style across Michigan State University's campus. And I went into class, little CP town, I'm a little late. And I had my fist, I mean my hand, raised. <laughs> and I asked my professor, please tell me this is not what you're teaching people to do. This is a class full of mostly white students learning how to teach black children. And he said, well, yes. I said, you can't do this. Schools are not petting zoos. You can't do this. And so I took it a little further, and I gave them some examples. I said, what if I went into a classroom, and I see a child, and I say, hi, Tran. I love your eyes. When I do this, I can't see very well, but you see just fine. Whoop, see, it's not good. And then I said, well, I took it a little further. What if I go to little Sally and say, hi, Sally, I love your blonde hair. It reminds me of my grandma's dog. It's a golden retriever. <laughs> See how left that could go? Real fast, real bad. And even though I was only 19, later in life, I learned that my instinct was right. Because one of my Pakistani friends told me when I was recounting this to her, she said, you know what, Sydney? When I was in the fourth grade, I was one of three children of color in Denver, in my Denver elementary school. My fourth grade teacher came up to me and said, oh gosh, Amira, you have beautiful eyelashes. They must really help you keep the sand out. Right? So I knew at that time I had to speak up and speak out loudly and clearly. So me with my Sophia sassiness, I decided I wasn't going to write a paper. I wrote the professor a letter. Dear Dwayne, you are in error. And so I wrote him a paper all about the error of his ways and turned it in. <laughs> and then I was nervous about my grade. Well, <laughs> being the Sophia kind of chick I am, I got an A and an apology, all right? <laughs> But looking back, after I was talking about this with my friend and laughing, I got a little quiet and I thought about it. And I said, why did that trigger me so badly? What was going on in my life at that time? Well, I was 19 years old at a predominantly white institution. And I, even though I had gone to predominantly white schools growing up, I never lived with the other students. So living in the dormitory, the white girls would look at us black girls and say, 
What is that oil you're putting in your hair? Oh, what are you smoke putting all over your legs? What is that smell when you curl your hair? We were constantly, constantly being critiqued about the most intimate parts of ourselves and our grooming and everything about us. And so I didn't like it as a 19-year-old, so I definitely didn't want to see five-year-old children go through that either. And then I thought about it a little more. And I said, Sydney, was that the, was that the time of the Deb incident? See, Deb was a girl who lived next door to me. She and a girl, Kelly, had a room next to mine. And on a Friday night, I was hanging out with six or seven other people in Deb and Kelly's room. And I was sitting on the bed, and Deb was on the floor next to me. And there was a girl that was entering the room. Her name was Megan. And my roommate and I overheard someone once called Megan Midge. And so as Megan came in the room, I said, hi, Midge. And again, Deb sitting on the floor. And she looks up at me and says, you scum-sucking ghetto whore. And I said, what? She said, you called me a bitch. I said, I said, hi, Midge. But y'all, <laughs> I'm a Sophia. <laughs> y'all saw the color purple. <laughs> Deb was a tall, a little taller than me. Blonde, curly hair down to her butt. I'm sitting on the bed. Deb's on the floor. I say, hi, Midge. Deb looks at me and says, you scum-sucking ghetto whore. So you remember how Miss Sophia was with Miss Millie? <laughs> and so I reached over and I got a handful of that blonde hair and I threw her face to the carpet and I rubbed it in and I threw her face to the carpet and I rubbed it in again and I threw it down. And you know when you're upset, you might have a little bit of a fight or flight response. That was my fight. I got up and left. That was my flight. Her boyfriend, none of her friends, they were all white. None of them spoke to her, and none of them followed me. So I went next door to my room, and I was really upset. I was enraged. And so it didn't take long for the RA and the minority A, Rebecca and Thyrone, to come to my room and knock. And I answered the door, and Rebecca says, Oh, Sydney, uh, we heard that uh, you slammed someone's head into the ground. <laughs> Y'all. I'm going to have to pull from my favorite movie line. God rest Miss Della Reese from Harlem Nights. I'm an honest hoe and all my hoes is honest. I looked right at them and I said I did. Deb called me a scum-sucking ghetto whore. And they said, okay, have a good night. So I didn't get in trouble. But again, looking back on that, it saddens me to know that over the years, I've heard stories about other incidents, some much bigger than that at my alma mater and other colleges, campuses across this country. And it makes me concerned about girls going to school now and what they're encountering. And it makes me sad that we're not as far as I thought we would be almost 30 years later. So I have a niece, I love my niece, little Nia, and she was going into her sophomore year of college. And I thought to myself, what would I do if Nia sees me tell this story and says, Auntie Sydney, would you do that again? And I had to think about it. And here's what I would tell my niece. I would say, you know what, Nia? I was young. I didn't have the, the tools or the temperament to handle something like that. And so I'm not proud of what I did. I was not raised like that. I was not raised to put hands and feet on people. So no, sweetie. Don't do what I did. If you go back over to Boston to your university in 2023 and a girl calls you a scum-sucking ghetto whore, don't do what I did. Auntie Sydney only used her hands. It's called hands and feet. Stomp that bitch! Yeah.